Well, it's uh, great to be back in uh, Wangarei, New Zealand, and um, Mary and I bring you lots of greetings, especially from those uh, Swiss visitors we've brought along to church over the years. And one, one in particular was Gisela. I don't know how many of you remember the lady Gisela. It was Marina's grandmother. Um, she didn't understand much English, but she said, I used to love coming along to church to listen to Pastor Adrian, because not only is he good looking, he's a powerful speaker. And um, so please pass that on to Adrian, eh? But no, it's good to be, it's good to be back here and um, to be back in my own bed. Um, it's just heavenly to be back in your own bed. But before we start this morning, I'd just like to do a, a bit of business. The nominating uh, committee asked the board to actually request the transfer of three lovely people. And the transfers have come through. And one is uh, from Belinda Lupi. She's transferring from Avondale Memorial Seven-day Adventist uh, Church with a highly recommend recommendation. And also for Brad and Scott Lupi from um, Papatoe Seven-day Adventist Community Church. And I'd like to present that to you, the church at large, and to let you know that we're registering their membership today. So all in favour of receiving these uh, lovely people? Thank you. Any against? No. Thank you for accepting that because we're actually getting a bargain. We're not only getting three people, we're getting seven. So um, we just got to look after them. And uh, I'd just like to say thank you for the wonderful work they've done uh, on behalf of our church in the past. So uh, welcome officially, guys. Uh, great to have you on board. Yes, um, God is good and he's immensely good. And of course, it was a bit hard starting work this week. So um, as I got to, to Thursday... No, sorry, uh, Friday, right? Yesterday. I thought, um, yeah, it's about time I rewarded myself for all these um, activities that I've been undertaking during the week. So I thought, oh, yeah, I'll just have some morning tea here at the tea my, um, tea my little coffee shop there. And as I, as I sat down, I sat down next to a, a young Māori chap um, and really well dressed. And um, I thought, well, Lord, this is obviously the man that you've sent today that I'm, I'm, got, I'm supposed to talk to. And uh, so I just said to him, and, uh, and who's going to win the rugby this weekend? And, uh, and he said, well, I think these guys are going to win uh, because and because. But he said, you know, I'm, I, don't, I don't have a clue. He said, I just thought I had to say something. And, uh, and I said, that's fine. And so we're on, we're on the same level, you know. And uh, he said, uh, I said, I introduced myself. And uh, I said, where are you from? He said, well, originally I come from Tikal. But he said, I work for Maori Television. And I said, oh, yeah, that's interesting. And I said, Dekal, I said, that's not a very big place, so you, you're related to a lot of people up there. And he said, yeah, I am, I am. And I said, well, I'm proud to, to announce that uh, we have an influence up there with the Seventh-day Adventist church. He said, yes, he says, I have an auntie who's, uh, who was a Seventh-day Adventist, and, of course, she used to uh, be out here on the far far left as not being accepted amongst the, the Anglicans and, and the Ratanas. But uh, uh, we respected her position, and we buried her as, as a Seventh-day Adventist. And then I said, well, you know, I'm a seven-day Adventist and explained my position. And I just talked to him about, about our belief and, and why we worship on Sunday and... I'm uh, oh, sorry, on Sabbath. <laughs> and why, he doesn't, why he shouldn't worship on Sunday, I mean, and why we worship on Sabbath. And, um, and he thanked me immensely. He said, hey, hey, he said, can I, can I have your details? So he put his, uh, my details into his phone. And, um, and uh, I said, well, look, send me a text. So I've got your details too. So he did. Um, and he said, you're not safe anymore, Gary, because I've got your details. I mean, praise the Lord. And little to be known that he's not safe either. Because last night as Sabbath came in, I thought about Dean, and I said, um, yeah, I'm going to give him a text. So I, I texted him, and I thanked him for sharing with me during the day. And uh, I just said, the Sabbath of the Lord has now come upon the earth because of Friday night. It starts with sunset, and I wished him a happy Sabbath. Um, and it was nice. You know what I got for an answer? Kia bro. Thank you very much. So we just never know. We just never know who the Lord's got out there um, for us to make contact with. And um, there's somebody every day. And that's the way the Holy Spirit works in our lives. For my illustration this morning, I'm going to be using two names. And these two names are names two of members, but the story doesn't actually affect these people uh, because I'm not actually talking about them. I'm just using names that are similar to theirs. You might see some similarities through the characteristics, but uh, it's not about those people. So my illustration this morning is about a man called David. 
And uh, he, uh, he became absolutely in love with this young lady, and her name happened to be Andrea. And um, he said to his dear friend, Ken, at the time, he said, Ken, he said, oh, I just wanted to do something special, special for, for, for this, this young lady, Andrea. And Ken suggested, he said, well, why don't you take her out to dinner? And David said, that's a great idea. Why didn't I think of that? So David, being uh, David, he said, okay. So he takes her along to his favorite restaurant, McDonald's. And, um, <laughs> and they had a, had a wonderful time there together discussing and chatting over different things. And, uh, and uh, David said to Andrew, we'll have to do this again sometime. And she said, yeah, I'd love that. That'd, that'd be really nice. So... Um, as the time continued, it became the second time, the third time, and it got right up to the fifth time that David invited Andrea out for dinner. And, of course, it was always at McDonald's. On the fifth time, she said to him, David, I've got to talk to you. David's kind of looking into his hamburger thinking, oh, what's this all about? And she said, I want to know what the DTR is. David really had to turn over his hamburger to find out what DTR means. All that Andrea was wanting to know was, she said, I want you now to determine the relationship. Where are we going to go from here? Well, as you know, the, ones, the, the people by the same name here in our church, they got married, and I hope the ones in my story did too. Determine the relationship. How do we determine the relationship? Another illustration, Jesus, you're in a restaurant and you're maybe just kind of hiding at the back and you're thinking, I just want to spend time alone. And then all of a sudden Jesus walks in and, uh, and you're, you're quite embarrassed because you just realize that as you went to have your meal, you forgot to say grace. So quickly you say grace trying to, to influence your Lord, uh, but it doesn't happen because he knows your heart. And Jesus simply looks down at you and says, I want you to determine the relationship. And you've heard me talk about relationship before, but I think it is more important as we are now studying uh, in our Sabbath school, revival and reformation. Because as you know, revival doesn't start as, with, with the church at large. It starts, it starts on an individual basis, revival. What is my personal relationship with the Lord? And by determining the relationship, we are asking for a level of commitment uh, to our Lord, a commitment of our walk with the Lord, a commitment of our, our, our faith. Are we simply fans while all is going great? And is this what, what you do? Are we just fans or are we becoming real followers of the Lord Jesus Christ? You know, the word fan simply means in the dictionary an enthusiastic admirer example. For an example, we could take a rugby player or one of the Olympic champions. And um, it's amazing to note, you know, um, when you think of people who are fans of, of, of a particular rugby team and uh, we simply have the best in the world with the All Blacks, um, you can ask a lot of people today and they might say, well, you know, I'm a fan of, of, uh, of the All Blacks, but especially uh, Dan Carter or somebody else within the team. And it's amazing, you know, they, they'll know a lot about that particular fan. They'll know maybe his shoe size, um, what type of car he drives, where he lives, um, how many children he has, and, 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 and maybe too what type of uh, food he eats or whatever. And this is typical of us, isn't it, when we have somebody that we admire admire, we, we seem to have a lot of information that we collect about that particular person. But in essence, we do not know that person really, do we? We kind of just admire them as we know them. And it's interesting also to note that a lot of us, um, when, when there's fans around or when the rugby team or a sports team comes into town, we try and get as close to, as close as them as possible, whether they're um, exiting a bus or boarding a bus, or they're having an interview, or they're gathering around somewhere, we, we kind of kind of stand as close as we can to, to our fans, not, not necessarily wanting to, to, to interrupt them or, or have a chat to them, but, and just hope, hopefully someone will take our photo so that we've got a picture with our fans. But are we fans with Jesus Christ, or are we just followers? You know, when we grow up in the church, we know all the stories, don't we? 
uh, as we come through the classes, through the Sabbath schools, we know about what Jesus did, how he healed people. And, um, and all, these, all that's great. We need that information because it develops in us a desire to want to get to know our Savior, Jesus Christ, even closer. Amen. Fans, fans go through the, through the motions, but followers go uh, put their motions into, into actions. Fans want to be close enough to Jesus to get all the benefits, but not so close that it requires sacrifice. You know, it is, it is, um, it is hard to live a Christian life, you know, to follow Jesus in every sense and becoming aware um, of what he's asking us to do on a, on a daily basis. Jesus was never interested in having admirers. No, it's not fans he's looking for. He wants, uh, wants to, have, uh, to have followers. And I remember, to the story um, that we find in, in 1 John 19, 51, uh, 19, sorry, verse 19, 251. It's about, um, about John the Baptist. And uh, I'd just like to take it from the point of view also about the Sanhedrin. We all have heard about the name, the Sanhedrin, and the Pharisees in, in, in Scripture. And when we look at the, the Sanhedrin, they were equivalent to a supreme court. They were the leaders of the, of the Jewish um, nation back then. They were made up of uh, teachers um, uh, and, and priests also, and leaders of the community. And of course, they'd heard that John the Baptist was down at the river baptizing people, but they never really showed great interest in going down to hear what John was preaching in case they would have to change their lives. They'd set up their, their life to be one of rules and regulations, and they knew a lot about Scripture, and they knew that the 70 week of Daniel was about to expire and that the Messiah was due to come. So they thought, well, normally, um, to, for someone to be active as John was, they would he would really need to ask the Sanhedrin for permission. But John didn't do that. He was, he was ordained by God for a special mission to prepare a way for the Messiah to come, to prepare people for the Messiah to come. However, they decided to get a delegation together and go down and talk to John to find out why and who allowed him to preach as he did. So the delegation goes down to the river, just uh, north uh, on the Jordan River. John was baptizing people. Can't just remember the actual ought, but their place. Um, and um, they, they went down, of course, you know, the Sanhedrin, you could see them coming a mile away. They were dressed in their elaborate gowns and very pompous, the way they, they uh, carried themselves. And they kind of pushed their way through the crowds, and uh, the crowds just departed to, to make way. And as they came down to John, they asked him, upon what authority are you baptizing? John just, just looked at them. They asked him and he said, are you, are you Elijah? And he said, no. He said, they said to him, are you Moses? And uh, he said, no. Um, and he said, well, then on what authority are you baptizing people? And then that's when John remembered and he said, um, he said to them, um, behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. He said, in other words, I am preparing the way for the Lamb of God to come. And uh, they were a bit dumbfounded because they didn't know what, what they were going to take back um, to, to the Sanhedrin to give as an answer. And then um, John simply said to them in, uh, in John 1.29, he said, uh, the next day John sees Jesus coming to him and said, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. There were fans amongst that group of people um, when John was uh, preaching and baptizing. There were people sitting on the bank. And on that particular day, too, they saw the Sanhedrin come down and, and speak to John. They actually saw a man um, dressed very simply go into the water and be baptized. But they did not recognize him as Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, because of the fact they hadn't repented. They hadn't 
changed their lives. They were just interested and they found it amusing to see this man, John, preaching every day and, uh, and baptizing. But the message they did not take on board. There was not a born again experience in their lives. And even when the heavens opened and the Lord, the Heavenly Father said, this is my, my son in whom I am well pleased, they didn't hear that message because they weren't repented. They were fans. They were not followers of John. And how much does that happen in our churches today? Whereby we come to worship God and we have a wonderful worship experience where we can feel the power of the Holy Spirit, the presence of God and his angels. Some people are excited and others don't even notice it. I'd rather be a follower, wouldn't you, than a fan to experience the power of God uh, in our lives. In the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 4, uh, reading from verse 17. And it says, From the time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of, of heaven is at hand. And Jesus, walking by the sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon, called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he said unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straight away left their nets and followed him. And going on from thence, he saw other two brethren, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in a ship with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them, and they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. An amazing um, report on how these disciples just got up and followed him. But from the book of John 1, 9, we know that Jesus was not unfamiliar with, uh, with Andrew and, and Peter because we have also um, the record that the followers of John on that particular day when they saw Jesus baptized, they were so impressed with Jesus that they followed him. And Jesus, as they were following, he turned around to uh, Andrew and John and says, uh, what seeketh you? And he said, uh, we want to know where you live. And, uh, and they, he said, well, come, come with me. And they followed him. Um, so they, they were really the first followers, um, John and Andrew, the first followers. And here we have another record of how uh, Andrew and um, Peter had an encounter with Jesus and just dropped everything and followed him. How is that with us today? Are we, you know, when we first come to the Lord, whether we grow up in the church or not, we have this wonderful experience, a born-again experience, hopefully, that, uh, you know, we call our first love. I'd like us to all to still cherish and have that first love so that we're not just fans but followers, true followers of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, and that's not something that we, um, we practice once a month or every couple of weeks. It's a daily experience of following the Lord, just as these guys were so willing, willing to, to give up everything to follow their Lord. You know, we have a lot of things in our lives that, uh, that bog us down and, uh, and trip us up. But it's time to put things aside so that we can clearly follow our Lord. You know, it's, it's amazing um, what, when, you're, when you're overseas and you have opportunity to read other, other literature. And uh, it's sad to see that what is happening around the world. But it's also another indicator, a checklist that Jesus is coming. In, in southern Germany, in, in um, Bayern, where, where the, the area of Munich um, they've taken out Christian education out of the school and replaced it with Islam. Um, and that is so sad, isn't it? You know, Here they had the, the original, the, the truth of the word, and now they've brought in a, in a, in a counterfeit with, uh, with Islam. And it's happening all, all throughout uh, Germany and other parts of Europe and also in Belgium, we read. So it's time for us to become true followers of Christ, not just to... To, to put on the appearance of being fans, but to be true, true followers of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. I read a, an article also from a pastor, uh, Pastor Kylie Eidelman, who's, a, who's the minister of a, of a huge church in America. And uh, after preaching one, one, one weekend, uh, he had a man come to him, uh, a big man who was really upset and concerned about the fact that he had a prodigal daughter. His daughter had left the church and was involved in, in a relationship. 
and uh, he just poured his heart out to Pastor Kyle. And, of course, Pastor Kyle, in his article, stated that, you know, he hears these stories over and over again about the prodigal daughter, the prodigal son. But he said, what these people tell me is true. He said that it's always the same, same statement. We educated them. We brought them up in the church, but we didn't bring them up in Jesus Christ. We brought them up in the church, but we didn't bring them up into Jesus Christ. We have to teach our children, our young people, who Jesus Christ is. They know the stories, as I said before, but to let them have a tangible relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. It's interesting what we see on the internet sometimes. Even people in our own church put on the internet that they're in a relationship with this person or that person. But none of us put on the internet that we're in a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's a challenge for you all. I'll be looking forward to it. Reading from uh, away from the the book of Matthew in, in chapter four, it's amazing when you carry on into chapters five and six. Uh, for, for all of you that have the, uh, the red uh, illustration of, of the words that Jesus spoke, um, the whole chapter 5 and chapter 6 are just totally saturated in red. And, uh, and it's interesting because from the, from the uh, Mount of Blessings, from the Beatitudes onwards, Jesus is constantly asking us or telling us how he wants us to follow him. And all the way through chapter 5, you see this word, I, I. And I'll just give you a couple of examples here where Jesus says, um, come over to, um, to verse 18 of chapter 5, and he says, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass one jot or one tittle, shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. In other words, he's telling us and giving us the confirmation that his word is his word. He goes down and says in verse 20, For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. So he's, he's counseling us all the way through and as followers. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, our fool shall be in danger of hell fire. So all the way through, you can see Jesus counselling us. But I say unto you, but I say unto you, and and he says um, uh, another one. Um, yeah, it's mainly, but I say unto you, or let not your communication. And all the way through, it ends up over in um, chapter seven, in verse verse twenty-eight, and. Chapter 7, verse 28. And it came to pass, when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one has having authority and not as, as the scribes. Brothers and sisters, we serve the God of heaven, who counted it worthy enough to come down to this old, dark, dingy planet to die for each and every one of us. That's a privilege to belong to the, to the church of God, isn't it? For he taught them as one who had authority. You know, many people over the years, and even in the time that my wife and I have been a member of this, uh, this, uh, this church, uh, which is now in exceeding 30 years, we've seen many people come and go. And it's sad uh, because they're missing out on, on a wonderful hope that we all share. Many have joined the church and they've just simply come along as fans and haven't experienced that that joy of following our Lord Jesus Christ. The joy of knowing Jesus Christ, not just what he did, but who he was and who he is and what he's going to do. Jesus' last discourse with his disciples before he was crucified was interesting. And you can imagine it, you know, after three and a half years, they've been working and walking and living and, uh, with Jesus and they've seen what he's done and they're, they're impressed. And then all of a sudden he tells them that he's about to leave. The crucifixion, crucifixion has taken place and he's about, he's about to go home to the Father. 
His disciples are confused and upset that their friend and teacher is talking about being killed. And Jesus explains in John 16, verse 7. If we just could uh, turn to that verse, please. John 16, verse 7. John 16, verse 7, it says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient that, uh, sorry, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. A real powerful text, you know. Jesus was concerned uh, about leaving his disciples alone. But he said, you're not going to be alone because I'm going to send a Comforter. And um, when we jump away from that text, um, I'll just come back to it. Isn't it interesting where he said, it is, it is expedient for you that I go away. In other words, he's saying, it is necessary that I go away so that I can send you this comforter. But he said, as soon as I depart, I will send him to you. Now, I'd just like to, to read from Matthew chapter 121 to prove the point and what I'm trying to illustrate here. And in Matthew chapter 121, it simply says, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Simply meaning that God with us. Emmanuel, meaning God with us. So that as Jesus came to the earth, we had God incarnate living amongst us, Jesus Christ. And so this is what Jesus is saying to his disciples, whom we are also, amen? Paraphrasing now, Jesus says, it is better for you if I go, because while God with you is good, listen, Emmanuel, God is with you, it is better that God is in you. By sending us the Holy Spirit, uh, the Comforter, where does the Holy Spirit live? He lives in us, our temple. The body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus was God with us, as he is still now, but he is also God in us. The Spirit that Jesus had in him was the Spirit of truth, and the Holy Spirit that was sent for us, uh, sent to us and to dwell in us, is also the spirit of truth. John 14, verse 7, uh, sorry, verse 17, simply says, Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. God with us, God in you. Isn't that powerful? The world does not know that because they won't receive him. They haven't got the faith to believe. They haven't got the faith to understand that the Sabbath is a day of rest, a day to keep holy. And they miss out on the other commandments too. Jesus has given us his Holy Spirit to simply live in us as his followers so that we are comforted and, and are able through his power to overcome sin. We cannot do it by ourselves. Powerful, isn't it? And of course, too, in referring uh, to this and trying to stay in the same theme, I love the story that is mentioned in John chapter 3. And I'd like you just to turn to that again. John chapter 3. And of course, it's talking about one of the, one of the Pharisees. And um, this is a, a really, really interesting story um, about uh, Nicodemus. Because um, the, the scripture starts off in verse 1 where it says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Now I just want to back up here a little bit too just to give you a bit of explanation into why Nicodemus came when he did. It was only the day before that uh, Nicodemus saw how Jesus drove uh, the people the, um, out of the temple. 
and how he did it and the words that he spoke. And as soon as Jesus walked into that temple and stood quietly, his divinity flashed through him. And, uh, and, and Nicodemus saw this and he thought, wow. He said, this man is, is, uh, is different to the prophets that we've had of, had of old. He then goes and back and opens up his, his scroll and starts reading about the coming of the Messiah. But 